Ben, uh, thanks for coming in. Um, we're going to have a little chat about Bloom's taxonomy. Yes. Uh, and how that relates to assessment. Um, it's a huge area. It is, and you know, I know we, we, we both use it in our teaching, and uh, I find it's really, I mean, just understanding blooms is really helping my own teaching. Um, you know, being able to apply it in, in the classroom to, to be able to stretch and challenge students, and also be able to kind of know what, what sort of questions to ask. Okay, so I mean, at a kind of basic understanding, I mean, would you agree that Bloom's taxonomy is really a system uh, for categorising learning or for categorising the cognitive skills um, used in, in learning and that's essentially um, the nuts and bolts behind it. There are different areas within Bloom but for teaching I think the cognitive processing side is a key part. Exactly and you know it, it's, it's knowing you know, that there are some questions that are actually going to require a lot more cognitive processing than others mm -hmm. and being able to identify when to use, you know, to, to use the high order thinking skills. So these could be things like, you know, creating, evaluating, analysing, and when to use sort of the lower order thinking skills like, you know, remembering and understanding. Uh, and sometimes uh, we talk about lower order thinking skills. Uh, sometimes they're described as lots. Yes. You get lots and, and hots. Lots, lots yeah. the lower order thinking skills, and the hots the higher order thinking skills. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk a, a bit more detail about the, how this can be used for teachers and the application in the classroom. I think a very common way that I use it is with questions. Mm -hmm. um, and where, let's say, you might ask, uh, use it for differentiating questions. So for direct questions in the classroom, you might uh, start off or with lower order question skills. Uh, what is this? Um, why is X something? And then maybe you might have higher order thinking skills, why is X like this? What's the difference between X and Y and Y um, as a more kind of analytical uh, question? Exactly, yes, and, and, and I agree, and I, I use it in a very similar way, but I don't always necessarily use low order thinking mm. skills at the start. You know, mm. Sometimes you might go yeah. into sort of like high order thinking skills. Um, so uh, it, depends, it depends on the group, but what I've found is you know, if I want to engage all the learners and I have got a mixed ability class, I might start off with some of the low order thinking skills and focus focus on maybe the learn the um, sort of like the um, less able learners mm -hmm. and then uh, reserve the higher order thinking skills for the more for the more able ones. I mean you, you gave a nice example when we were talking about this earlier, uh, about Paris. Uh, I don't know if you want to yeah. describe that now. Well you, you know if I ask you the question um, What's the capital of France? Paris. Yes. And I'm glad uh, I practiced that. <laughs> and if I said to you, now, um, Paris has a, a, a problem with pollution. Um, what can be done to reduce the pollution? Uh, I suppose we could um, limit the number of cars that, that go in on a, on a certain day. So you might have cars with one type of number plate or one number plate number on one day and then the other cars go in on another day and try and reduce the number of cars by 50% that way perhaps. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Now, the first question, which was, um, was the capital of France, how difficult was that? It was quite easy. Okay. And the second question, how could you reduce the pollution in Paris? It was a bit harder. I had to think a bit more and bring in some extra information. Okay. To and this is an question. example, the first question was an example of a lot, and the second question is an example of a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where you can make sure that you know you can use the lot questions for you know, students who might be struggling, mm -hmm. and uh, the hot of the more uh, able students may want to stretch and challenge them. Okay, yeah, it's a nice example. Okay, let's talk um, a little bit about how uh, the taxonomy of Bloom can be used in exam questions as well. So I think it's not just in classroom application, which no. is it's but also in exams and, and that kind of demonstration of achievements as well. Um, and I think sometimes in marking schemes you can see that, um, let's say, a C pass for something might be where someone applies something, but yes. maybe a, a merit pass might be where someone analyzes something perhaps and they take it that bit further. Exactly. And I think, you know, it's showing that you just, that you know more than understanding and you actually know how this applies, how to how it works in, pra in practical terms, mm -hmm. and um, 
that's where you know you get to see uh, the difference between the past and a, a distinction. And also you'll find with exams that you know you have, for example, like a level two exam. But like a like a school GCSE, a sixteen year old type exam. And what sort of questions would you expect to see there? Well, it's been a while. <laughs> but it, it would generally be sort of like, do you think you're going to see the the high order thinking questions or? I mean, probably, um, I, I would say that a GCSE if you're 16 years old is more the um, understanding, maybe a little bit of applying, but I'd say mainly the understanding type of questions. Yes. And then as you go up and you get to a master's level, you know, you'd probably be starting to, to be a bit more critical. And not just understanding, you'd be expected to know it, but be able to evaluate different sources and say, well, actually, I disagree with this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and be able to... Um, draw on a number of different sources and, and come up with a formula your own opinion. So the, the higher up the, the taxonomy you're going, you're bringing in more knowledge, more cognitive processing, and that's also reflected in the type of qualification or type of exam you're doing. So let's say level two GCSE is more remembering and understanding. If I, I'm now thinking back to my uh, GCSE chemistry where I, where I had to write uh, the chemical formula. I was dreadful at it, but I had to remember that and I couldn't do it. Um, but then if you think about a master's qualification it's, or, or even a, a, an undergraduate degree, there's that evaluation and maybe master's level, level seven, delta, dip, t, so there's that critical evaluation exactly. uh, and it's, it's considering that information according to different circumstances and requires a lot more thinking. Exactly. Now if we, took, if we look at English language teaching, what you might find is you might be looking at, um, say, Things present perfect, so work on present perfect, let's say, or it could be a tense, it could be a function, and you start off by doing some sort of like control practice type of activities mm -hmm. where students are just having to remember, okay, I need to use present perfect here or past symbol here, and then as they start mastering it, you go up and you ask them to maybe, um, you could ask them to maybe produce a little TV advert or a news report, and now the creating, which is a high order thinking skill. So what they're having to do is they're having to make decisions when they sh should use certain tenses and what language to use. So this is how you can use blooms in a language classroom, is you can actually progress as students get more and more comfortable with the language. You can challenge them to use it in a more, uh, more demanding, more difficult way. And I suppose that brings us on to a demonstration of, of Bloom in, in student outcomes uh, and actually demonstrating what students can do linked to Bloom, as you say. So uh, in a class, it might be that, I suppose if you had a differentiated class, you could that some students are, uh, are maybe copying something, uh, some students are applying that thing, and some students are creating something at an extreme kind of level. Exactly, yeah. And that would be it. I mean, that would be a, a really good way of making sure that everybody is doing the same topic, mm -hmm. but just being stretched in different ways. Okay. So, I mean, if we, I mean you mentioned role play, uh, for example. So, what in the, the taxonomy there? What skills are the students really applying? And let's say uh, I'm at a uh, or maybe a presentation. We'll go for a presentation. Well, I think they, very often they don't just you know um, apply one or two of the skills, they actually apply quite a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that they're having to remember information, understand and process that information, apply their knowledge to maybe practical things, analyze how effective, um, analyze you know, how maybe the best way to do something, evaluate it, create. They could, have, they could use all of the different skills. Now depending on the, on the student's ability, they may may not do that much creating, or may not do that much evaluating, but there may be some elements, and I think that depends on, on, on each student. I think that's a very good point to, to make, uh, that individual tasks aren't necessarily just ticking one box or other, no. it's about that student's reaction to that task, uh, that they might do two or three things, and, and things like maybe they apply it, they analyse and evaluate, and you know, there's a lot of crossover there, there's, they're not really strictly delineated in many cases. Yes. Um, and also remembering, as you were suggesting, it's not linear. You don't always have to go from remembering to understanding to applying. You can just go and apply. It depends on what that task is. Finally, this, I think, brings us quite nicely onto the lesson objectives. When it comes to the teacher, when the teacher is planning a lesson, um, I know that when I'm assessing a lesson, uh, it's nice to see a variety of learning objectives. Not that students will remember this, students will remember that. Um, but 
there's some kind of recognition that there are different levels of, of cognitive processing within a lesson. And sometimes that can be re uh, demonstrated through the learning objectives. Absolutely, and I think that's what teachers need to do. They need to have those high-order thinking skills mm -hmm. in there to, to show that they are stretching the more able learners and they are giving learners an opportunity not just to remember but to apply their knowledge and to use their knowledge um, to create stories. To, you know, For example, I've had students write newspaper articles or create little TV ads mm -hmm. which they've recorded on their phones and it's been that they've really, really enjoyed it because it's not just remembering and writing down, filling in, you know, um, gap fills. And they love that creative element. Sure, they might need some help and support, but, you know, I think they, they, they welcome that, those challenges that, you know, the high order thinking skills bring. Uh, and it's also, therefore, pedagogically sound. And some people may think teachers, or an old school approach to teaching, like, you know, if they're not quiet, if they're not writing, if they're not filling bits of paper, that's not learning. But evidence would suggest, actually, that you get students doing other things, of being a little more creative or doing things higher up, applying information, not necessarily just writing and copying, that they learn that's an effective way of learning. Absolutely. And a recent study um, conducted by Cambridge University, and I'm not sure if you saw it, I think it was... The, the, the Lego one. That's right, where there were primary school children were using... Um, uh, Lego and uh, making, uh, constructing different buildings and things, and having to write a story based on their constructions, uh, what they could, what they constructed, and they found out they were performing much, much better. It was a pilot, and now the school where they piloted this study are actually going to incorporate it in their curriculum, and it helps with creativity. It, it, it gets you know the students to actually use. Um, a much greater range of language, which maybe they, they wouldn't have done if they had just been asked to write a story. So helping with their overall cognitive development. Exactly. All right, brilliant. Um, Aben, thank you very much for talking about that. Thanks a lot, Ben.